Amen. So for the last few weeks, especially as we've been going through Advent season, we've been honing in on the stories of people who are witnesses of Christ's coming. The first week we talked about Mary, who, you know, when she received the prophetic word about what was going to happen, she was likely about a 13-year-old girl. And Probably she was alone and unsure and scared out of her mind. I don't know if you remember what it, what it felt like to be a 13-year-old, uh, but you don't have everything together. You're still trying to figure out life. But Mary, in faith, she responded to an angelic visitation and the promise of God by saying, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the kind of surrender and trust that it takes to respond in this way to an invitation that has no guarantees, has no safety nets, has no, like she had everything to lose and nothing to gain, but she responded in faith. And she became a very unlikely vessel for the miracle of the incarnate word of God to come through her. Now, the second week, we talk about Zechariah and Elizabeth, their relatives of Mary's, and they played a small part in a big story. They are the parents of John the Baptist that we've been talking about this past year. And it was through John the Baptist that God heralded and welcomed and forerun Jesus' coming. And then last week, we had Pastor Jacob talk to us about a prophetess by the name of Anna, who in the wake of losing her husband, so she was probably, if she was married around the same age as Mary would have had uh, been married back in the day, so maybe as a 13, 14, 15 year old, seven years into being married, she lost her husband. And it was then that she chose to turn to the Lord and she began to seek him and hold fast to his promise. She began a lifestyle of worshiping and fasting and praying in the temple until she saw Jesus when she was an 84-year-old widow. Pastor Jacob had mentioned it's either she was 84 years old-ish or she was over 100 years old, whatever the case may be. That's a long time to be fasting and praying day and night in the temple until she saw the promise of God being fulfilled before her eyes. And so every week we've been going through all these different people who were there at the coming of Christ. And so today we will focus on, once again on one of the more quote unquote minor characters, people whose background and people whose stories and actually people whose names we don't really know, but they were the first people to witness Jesus Christ, the Son of God, other than Mary and Joseph, of course. And these are the shepherd boys. Today we had Lashion, right? He was the one who was dressed as a shepherd. And so, you know, the presentation that we saw today is a little bit anachronistic because we have to give everybody a role, right? In case, you know, you, you've, you've read the, the gospel accounts of the birth of Jesus, the wise men didn't come until after. And so they weren't there at the birth of Jesus. There were sheep probably, yes. There were angels, yes. There were uh, shepherds, yes. Uh, but the wise men didn't come until later. That's just some trivia for you guys to know. And so to, the title of today's message is An Unlikely Welcoming Committee. An Unlikely Welcoming Committee. You know, this might be a passage that many of us have read before, especially if we've been a Christian for a long time. But as I've been meditating on this passage this year, it struck me that out of all the people that he could have uh, had welcome him into the world, he chose these shepherds. You know, if we've grown up Christian or seen depictions of Jesus as a shepherd, maybe you have a certain picture in your mind or, of what a shepherd looks like. If you grew up in, in like an immigrant Korean church, which I did growing up in Chile, um, you know, every end of the year we would get as a gift, we would get a calendar for the following year. There always would be a Christian calendar. There would always be depictions of Jesus as the good shepherd. And he would be like in these rolling green hills and he would have like flowing, like shampoo commercial hair and the sun is shining and his robes are like flowing white and it's just such a beautiful picture but it's very inaccurate <laughs> to what a shepherd actually looks like you know a shepherd you know is actually a very very lowly job it's a dirty job 
It, it, their feet were probably covered in dirt and mud. They probably had very calloused hands. Hair was probably layered with dirt. Their layers of clothing, they were purely functional because they were exposed to the elements. And so it's not an aesthetic at all. Like it's a very lowly job. It is not something that is, you know, we often romanticize it in our minds, but it's actually a, a very lowly, very humble job. These were people who were out in the fields. They were not influential in any way. They were not making money. They were probably not affluent. They're probably their families, you know, weren't affluent either. They're probably uneducated. They were like out in the hills somewhere forgotten. And the only people that were there uh, to be with them were just sheep, you know? And their job, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be holding a, a staff and these sheep are going to be, you know, following me. No, they're like wrestling these animals. The sheep are known to be very stupid animals, actually. And so when the Bible says that we are sheep, actually it's a very like, kind of backhanded kind of, you know, a, a revelation of just how dependent we are on a shepherd, right? So these are not intellectual animals. They are just very, uh, very stupid and dependent on their shepherd. And so the shepherd had to do everything in their power to keep them alive, to feed them, to tell them exactly where to go, to make sure that their predators weren't uh, too close by, they would be ready to fight. Um, these were, this is what a shepherd's job looked like. It wasn't this clean, pristine, kind of flowing out in the wild, like kind of like the sound of music kind of scenery. It wasn't like that at all. And so we cannot romanticize it in this way. And out of all the influential people and religious elites and philosophical figures and military heroes that God could have chosen to welcome in the living, breathing word of God stepping into humanity, out of all those people he could have chosen, he tapped on the shoulders of these unseen, humble, uneducated, poor, often looked down upon boys to make the most unlikely welcoming committee ever conceived and to usher in the greatest person that ever walked on this earth. You know, have you ever seen the entourage that a president has when he arrives somewhere? It's usually bulletproof cars, armed guards on motorcycles, drivers, secret service, high-ranking officials, you know? Or if you've been in Korea and you've been out in Incheon Airport, once in a while you'll get to, you know, go to the arrivals gate. And if there's a butt ton of people and everybody's got a camera out and like a lot of them are girls, usually it means that there's a celebrity that's arriving. And I've had the misfortune of being in the midst of like a throng of like enamored fans. And so there's like cameras and press and there's like a bodyguard usually. There's a car waiting. And why is it? that important people surround themselves in this way upon their arrival, it's because where they choose to go and who they surround themselves with and how much of a following they have is reflective of who they are. It's reflective of their status, it's reflective of their influence and of their success. And so this arrival that we read of today is much greater than of any president, much greater than any CEO, any celebrity or whatnot. This is the God of the universe. You know, in the beginning was the word, like that God who breathed out stars, the God who is ancient of days. Uh, it is in this small, dusty town called Bethlehem that he comes down, and it's to the reception of a few poor shepherd boys who are out in the pastures that God chooses to step into our world. Now, this is one of those times when our human wisdom should be offended. You're like, what in the world? That makes absolutely no sense. Who did the PR? Who, like, who, who organized this thing, right? We should feel very offended. This is when we should be scratching our heads and wonder why God does it the way that he chooses to do it. And this is where God's infinite wisdom and his sovereign power, it should make us worship. Now, first of all, before we actually go into uh, our different points for today, as random as Bethlehem was, now Bethlehem is not in any way significant as a city. It's like saying into the little town of even Hejon is too big. Like into what's a really small town that, that nobody really knows about in Korea? Yeah. Huh? Suwon? No, Suwon is still pretty rich, I would say. Hmm. Huh? Tebek. Okay, Tebek. 
Okay, Tebek, okay. So imagine if we had like a very important person flying into Korea, instead of making their residence Seoul, like which is the hub of everything, they, were, they went like, you know the place that I really want to go is Tebek, and that's where I'm going to come in, right? It's just as random. It's Bethlehem was, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a small, dusty little town, and it was felt very random, but it had been prophesied 700 years before that day that the Messiah would come to the smallest of the 12 clans. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, this is 700, before, it's 700 years before Jesus steps into the scene, it says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. So we, we've talked about this before. Ephrathah is another, uh, another way to uh, say Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So we're not talking about a normal person. We're not talking about somebody who was just born out of nowhere. It's somebody whose origins are from old, someone who's been there from the beginning. And this is how detailed God is. Even the detail of exactly where Jesus was born was prophesied 700 days before that. If it hadn't been for the census, that Joseph and Mary were going for, he would have been born in Nazareth because that's where they lived. And so even that small detail of it just happened to be that when she was about nine months pregnant, they asked for the census. And man, as inconvenient as it was, they're like, oh, I guess, I guess we have to pick up and go to this even smaller, more remote town. It's about four days of a journey from Nazareth. And this wasn't just a random place, but it was a fulfillment of prophecy. One other note about Bethlehem, the word, the name Bethlehem, it's a, it's a compound of two different words in Hebrew. One is bet, which is house, and lechem, lechem, with a lechem, is bread. So Bethlehem means house of bread, house of bread. And so Jesus Christ, he is the bread of life. He is the manna from heaven that came to give us not just a day's worth of nourishment like manna did as it was falling from the sky for, for uh, the Israelites who were going through the Egyptian desert. It, he is the eternal bread that was broken for us for the forgiveness of our sins that we would have eternal life. You know, in John chapter 6, uh, verses 47 through 51, it says, this is Jesus speaking in, in parables, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the lechem of life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't an accident. It was a minor detail seemingly that was captured by Luke, and um, it's a prophetic fulfillment actually of something that had been spoken about 700 years before the birth of Christ. And so with that said, for today we're going to be zoning in on three different truths that we see from these humble shepherds who were the first to witness the living word of God in human flesh. Here's the first thing that we learn about the shepherds. The first thing is that Jesus invites us to be first-hand witnesses. It's not enough for us to hear about it. It's not enough for us to read about it. He actually invites us to be first-hand witnesses. Uh, verses 15 through 16, so we're going to be going through just a few verses, verse by verse. It reads, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, well, that was crazy. Let's go on with our day. That's not what they said, right? They said, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. So quickly, they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. It's one thing for us as believers to know secondhand. And it's quite another for us to actually know for ourselves. Because one million angels can appear to you in the night sky singing about all the wonderful prophecies that Christ is 
come to fulfill. You can have that all you want, but until you say, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, you will just be a person who has heard something miraculous on a random night, but you will not be a first and witness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Knowing about him is not the same as knowing him. This is the first thing that we learn about these shepherds. Now, for us as believers, you know that you can read the entirety of the word of God and actually not know God for yourself. It's just another book. It can be another book. I know people who have memorized, you know, great, you know, sections of this book. I know people that have been a part of church for many years. Maybe they've been brought up in the church. They know every song. They barely miss a Sunday. You know, they're there faithfully given. You can do all those things and actually not know God for yourself. You could attend every house church. You could give generously. You could be going to Zion Children's Home. You could be doing all of these things, but you will only be a secondhand witness until you know God for yourself. You know, the reason why we meet here on a weekly basis, the, the reason why gathering in person is actually really important for us. This is not just a program. This is not a TED Talk. This is not like a show. This is not a musical interlude. And then we're going to have somebody go up there and give a speech. And then, like, you know, hopefully we'll have a few, you know, conversations, meet a few cool people, and then head on our way. This is a congregation. This is a gathering. This is the church. Because as we gather together, the Holy Spirit dwells in our midst. And as we do this together as a community, our hope is that week after week, you're encountering the Lord for yourself. You can be sitting in that seat for the next few years to come and still never meet the Lord. You know that you can do that. You can, you can actually come out to church very faithfully and actually never encounter the Lord for yourself. Our job here as we gather, and even for the staff, the, the, the elders, all of us, our job here isn't for you to come to a program, it's for us to do everything that we can to bring you before the God who can make a change in your life. You're not going to get changing. You're not going to see transformation. You're not going to see healing. You're not going to see forgiveness in your life just by hearing human words and attending a human program. All of this is designed to bring you before the Spirit of God before whom you can be transformed. And so Jesus invites us to be firsthand witnesses. It's not enough just to hear about him. It's not enough to... Man, somebody had a great encounter with the Lord. Man, somebody, you know, prays so much. Somebody knows all these songs. It's not enough. You actually need to know God for yourself. And for us who live in, in today's kind of culture where Christian culture can become an idol in itself, where you can actually speak Christian, look Christian, sound Christian, but actually not be a Christian, it's actually a very sobering reminder for us that it doesn't matter who around us is encountering the Lord. If I am not encountering the Lord for myself, I've gained nothing. I've, I've gained, gained nothing. nothing. So, so Jesus invites us to be firsthand witnesses. I wonder what would have happened if the shepherds had been like, wow, that was a crazy angelic encounter, and just left it at that. You're like, wow. Somebody says all these things and sings all these songs about this Jesus Christ. That's so cool. Let me post about that on Instagram. And then you move on with your life. But because they chose at that moment, something clicked in their minds and said, that's cool, but I need to go and see for myself. I actually need to see this. I actually need to experience this. I actually need to come before. If this is truly, you know, the son of God, if this is truly the Messiah, then I need to go for myself and I need to see and experience, taste and see for myself. How much more are we as believers called to have that same response of it's not enough for me to know about him. I actually need to know him. I need to see him and to have a personal relationship with him. It, it's not, it's, it should, you should feel very dissatisfied if all you've experienced up until now is like, wow, these other people seem to be really close and really tight with Jesus. That's great. But there needs to be some kind of holy dissatisfaction in you. Of, man, like, I actually, I want to experience that too. I want to see that too. I want to see God moving in my life too. I want to hear his, hear his voice too. It doesn't matter that the pastor knows the word of God. Like, I actually want to know the word of God for myself. I want to mean the lyrics that I sing. I want to see deep transformation in my life. I want to see the desires of my heart transformed. All of these things, you should feel dissatisfied if you're not experiencing it at a first-hand 
capacity. This is the call that God makes, you know, to every person who comes before him. It's not enough that your parents are believers. It's not enough that you've attended church for a long time. It's, it's not enough even that you're baptized as a child. Like those things actually will amount to nothing if you don't know God for yourself. And so Jesus invites us to be firsthand witnesses, not to just stay off at a distance, not just, well, I hope everybody's having a really great time with Jesus and they know a lot about him, but he invites all of us. There's no qualifying factor here. Let's be reminded once again that if anybody who would have been worthy of coming before the, the incarnate word of God, it was these lowly shepherds. It teaches us that God is not looking and like, well, how educated are you? Have you been to seminary? Do you know these, these words by heart? You know, like how much have you given? He's not looking at any of these qualifying factors. He's saying, everybody is welcome. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That invitation is for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor. It doesn't matter if you're just a newborn believer. You've been a believer for three minutes. It doesn't matter. We're all called to be firsthand witnesses of Jesus Christ. Now, my second point for today that actually stuck out to me um, as I read this passage, I think it might be the first time that this, this thought ever occurred to me, is he doesn't just invite us to be witnesses, but Jesus also invites us to be encouragers, and this is what I mean by it. Verses 17 through 19, it reads, And when they saw it, they had known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And so something about that last sentence really stuck out to me. I've read this passage so many times before, but it didn't really hit me until this year. Sometimes we underestimate how our obedience and our story encourages other people around us. The effect that it has on people who might need to hear of God's faithfulness, who might need to be reminded of God's promises. Because what these shepherd boys didn't, uh, what the shepherd boys did didn't just affect them. It was a timely encouragement and confirmation, especially to Mary. Little did they know that what they said was actually really important for Mary to hear. Now, just, you know, bear with me for a second. I am a single person, so I have never had children. But I have a lot of people around me who have had children, right? And from what I hear, it's not a walk in the park right? It's not flowers and rainbows. Like giving birth to a living child is probably the most excruciating, most painful experience that any human can go through, right? And so it had been nine months since that angelic encounter with the angel Gabriel for Mary. It had been nine months since that encounter. And for all we know, there might not have been another, right? It had been nine months ago. It's like, well, that's a long time ago. A lot has happened since then. So to our knowledge, you know, there were no more angelic encounters between that first encounter and this, this time of Jesus' birth. It must have been a tough nine months. Not just the, pr the pregnancy in and of itself is very difficult. We've had different people in our community go through very, very, very painful, very difficult pregnancies. And so that in itself, it's already rough enough. But imagine on top of that, having to explain yourself to Joseph, to his family, to your family, having to deal with the suspicion and accusations of people around her, and then to top it off when she was about to pop, right? She was in the ninth month, she was full term, she had to travel to another city because of what seemed like an ill-timed bureaucratic formality, right? When, if you're nine months pregnant, you're not ready to get on anything for four days and travel to another town, right? Um, but this is what she had to go through. It was a census that was conducted. It happened to be conducted just then, and for which Joseph and herself, they needed to be in Bethlehem. And so scholars will say that it was about a four-day trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem if they traveled for about eight hours a day. Imagine being nine months pregnant, traveling through the desert for four days, about eight hours a day. And so when they arrive, to top it off, there's no place at the inn. For... 
the, the people who have shared with me about their birthing stories, they will tell me that everything matters. Like when you're choosing your OBGYN, your birthing center, like the music that you're gonna give birth to that you're listening to on your iPod, like uh, iPod, <laughs> iPhone, <laughs> whoa, that was a throwback. Um, like you need the temperature to be just right. You need the, the medical staff to be like top notch. You need them for, to be ready for any kind of complication. You want the, the, the person who's gonna be leading the whole procedure to be very competent and not forceful, but encouraging, you know, and some people here, even in our congregation, you know, they made it a, a point, like, I want to give birth in, in a Christian birthing center. And so everything just needed to be just right, you know, when, like, you want it to be ideal, you, because it's already going to be difficult enough, you want the temperature, the lighting, the comfort to be optimal, you want your partner to be there with you, like, and you squeeze the heck out of that hand, and they can't complain, and, like, it's going to take a long, long time to, to give birth, and you need to be ready for any unforeseen things that might come up, you, you know, even leading up to those days, you have, like, a backpack that is ready, you know, like, if your water breaks at any point, you're going to get up, and you're going to go, and so all of these things, these are all the ducks that need to be lined up in a row for you to feel some level of assurance that, okay, we're about to go into the most difficult and excruciating moment of my life, and I need to make sure that all of these other complications, like we, we get rid of all that so that I can just focus on giving birth to this baby. This is not what Mary experienced in any way. In any way, she was in a place that was you know, unfamiliar to her, um, she probably, her water probably broke as soon as they got there and there was no place at the inn, meaning that the only place that they could find, there'll be of some shelter, it was in a stable probably. And there was no place to actually put the child once, once they gave birth but except for this manger. Now, because we've grown up in Christianity for, for quite a long time, we kind of normalize that. A manger is no place, it's like just as random as saying, I don't know, like, what would be a random thing to, to place a baby on? Like, like a soundboard. Like, well, there's nowhere to put this baby, so let's put him on a... Like, something that was not meant for that. That was not what it was created for. And so Mary had none of these comforts. She had just finished giving birth to this baby. She probably was wishing that she could have provided something better for this baby, probably wondering how they're going to provide, maybe even wondering if the baby she had just given birth to was truly God because... God doesn't seem to be in the natural circumstances at that point. If it's God's will, wouldn't things kind of work out a little bit better for her? You know? Like, not like, oh my gosh, like, shoot, we got to pick up and go to this other town. Okay, oh my gosh, there's nowhere to give birth. Okay, we got to find a stable. Oh my gosh, there's nowhere to put, okay, let's put in a manger. Like, it's like all of these inconveniences, and it feels like, where is the Lord? If this is truly a prophetic word, if this is truly God's promise, if this is the Son of God, then shouldn't things be a little bit more smooth and convenient? And if, like, you would feel like everything's working in your favor, but that was not the case. I really wonder if I had been in Mary's situation. I would be like, I must have heard wrong. I must have heard, this is surely not the Son of God because we are in a lonely, dirty, smelly, you know, stable right now. There's nowhere to put this baby. I am all by myself. I am forgotten. The presence of the Lord seems so far away. And there's no way that this is God's purpose and God's plan. Mary was probably still exhausted and still probably very scared and very much in pain. You know, if, if we were in, the, in her shoes, we would probably come to the conclusion, like, this cannot be the word of God. This cannot be the fulfillment of God's promises. But these shepherd boys show up unannounced with the strangest and most bizarre story ever. They're probably coming up there and they're like, we're out there by the pastures. We're just minding our own business. We were like practicing our slingshot or like, you know, trying to, you know, make sure that, you know, this, like they're fighting, you know, a few sheep were fighting and like whatever, you know, and we were just minding our own business when this angel appeared out of nowhere. He scared, you know, the bejesus out of me, you know, and we had never seen anything like this before. We were super scared, but the angel said, fear not. For behold, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then, as if one angel 
wasn't scary enough, then a whole multitude of angels appeared in the sky and they were singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And we have no idea what that means. <laughs> like what in the world we have come to see for ourselves because we cannot make any sense out of this. Now this might have been just an interesting anecdote for some, but for Mary, who had just gone through all of that, it was very different. You know, it says that all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, but Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. The testimony of these shepherds, it wasn't just a cool story for her, it was a prophetic confirmation that what she what had heard was true, that this is truly the promised Messiah, that no matter how hidden, no matter how forgotten and unsupported and unseen as she probably felt in that moment of great need and great exhaustion and fear and maybe even feeling abandonment, heaven's eyes were on this little stable. The salvation of the whole world was laying in that manger and God's word was true. You know, how many times have you been in a situation where you begin to wonder if God has forgotten about you? How many times have you been in that situation where like, hey, maybe I just heard wrong. Maybe, maybe God has forgotten about me. Maybe he's dealing with, like he's, maybe he's busy. He's doing other things, you know. Uh, maybe he's forgotten about his promises. Is he really real or not? What if in those moments God sends you someone to remind you that he still moves, that his, world is still, his word is still real, that he hasn't left you, he hasn't forgotten you, and even though everything in the natural is pointing in another direction, his encouragement, his confirmation, and his reminder can come to you in the most unlikely of packages. This is what, what the shepherd boys did. This is what it meant for someone like Mary. And so let me flip that question. What if you're supposed to be the one to be that unlikely encourager to someone else who's going through a rough, maybe a lonely, maybe unseen struggle? What if you can be that shepherd boy that shows up in someone's dark night to remind them that God's promises still stand and that all the things might look bleak in the natural and you might feel forgotten all of heaven is actually paying attention. So what Jesus calls us to, it isn't just you know, to be first-hand witnesses, but actually to bear witness of what you've seen and be an encouragement to someone else. The shepherd boys probably didn't know all the ins and outs. They probably didn't know what those words meant for someone like Mary in that circumstance. But God used that to confirm to Mary. And as she was listening, like these random shepherd boys just came and they, they talked about this crazy story. And they have nothing to gain from this. I'm going to treasure these things up in my heart. I'm going to ponder them. This is the Lord speaking to me. It's not just some shepherd boys. And so Jesus invites us to be encouragers, maybe in the most unlikely fashion, maybe in the most inconvenient of times, Jesus invites us to be encouragers. Now lastly, Jesus invites us to be worshipers. In verse 20, it ends with, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard uh, as it had been told them. You know, this past year, we've talked about what it means to be a worshiper, to actually behold God and give him the glory that he is due. He's actually due something. He's owed something. And it's in the moment and the place of worship, actually, where the transformation in our hearts takes place when you encounter Jesus for yourself. So you don't have just the information. You don't just have the facts. You're not just at the right place and at the right time, but you allow yourself to take it in, to behold it, to let it transform you, to let it well up within you. And worship is the response to a revelation of who God is. That is the most simple uh, definition of what worship means. Worship is a response to revelation, a response to revelation. So I'm going to say it a different way. If you don't leave that place like these shepherds did, it's that glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, then maybe you haven't encountered God. Because encountering God should change you, and it incites a response in your heart. This is where, you know, when we talk about worship, this is one of my pet peeves. When people are like, I'm just not like a, a, a feely kind of guy. 
I'm not an emotional person. I'm not an expressive person. Like, first of all, it's not about you, right? <laughs> so whether you worship or not, it, it's not defined by, by, by you, your preference, or, or, or what kind of background you have, or you know, what kind of style you have. That's not what defines worship. If you're beholding a God before whom 24 elders bow down and cast their crowns at his feet, or angels surrounding them, are just mind blown at the glory and the beauty of God, then who are you to be like, eh, it's just not my style, you know? Uh, we just didn't grow up that way. Or like, I'm not really vibing with these songs that they're singing up there. Or like, I just had a rough week, so I don't know. Like, I just don't feel like worshiping today. Like, who are we to say that, <laughs> you know? Imagine somebody important walked in through here you know, imagine the president walked in through here. We're like, you know, I just had a rough day. So, uh, you know, just sit down anywhere and just do whatever you want, yeah? But if it's somebody who, who demands and who's owed a certain level of honor and respect, it has nothing to do with you. Everything to do with who you're responding to. In the same way, our God invites us to be worshipers. We lay aside our preferences. We lay aside our MBTI. I have a love-hate thing with MBTI. If one more person talks to me about MBTI, I'm going to, oh, Lord. You lay aside your MBTI. It doesn't matter what kind of profile you have. You worship God with everything you have. That's, that's who our God is. It has nothing to do with you, everything to do with what he is owed. And so when we as a community, we walk in here into our sanctuary, we're not walking in here with a mindset of like, well, let's, let's see what the priest team got today. Let, let's see if they're doing any of my favorite songs. Let's see if the ambience is right and the vibe is right. And then maybe if, if the preaching today, if it's on point, then maybe we'll see how I'll respond. We don't walk in with that kind of mindset. We walk in here knowing that we want to give something that is costly unto the Lord. That's what it means to be a worshiper. It's not, we're not coming, we're not coming in here as a consumer, uh, like an audience. We sit down like we would at, at, at like a, a, a theater, a movie theater, and be like, well, if this movie is good, then maybe I'll be, you know, that's not how we walk in here. We are all worshipers. This is a gathering. This is a church service. So we're not here to, you know, be dazzled by whatever kind of gifting we see up there or like how it's pandering to my needs and where I am. And if you do things just right, then maybe I'm going to worship. That's not the mentality that we have here as a community. We walk in here, man, if the person up there is like tone deaf, which they're not, you know, they're tone deaf and they're getting all the things wrong, I'm still going to worship the Lord. As for me and my household, I'm going to worship the Lord. That's it. I've made up my mind. It's my decision. It's a choice that I'm making as a worshiper. And so we're not walking in here thinking, okay, well, if things cater to me, then I will worship the Lord. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with the ambience. It has nothing to do with the vibe or the, the lyrics. It has nothing to do with that. It's everything to do with who God is and what he's worthy of. So Jesus invites us to be worshipers. It doesn't need to be your top two spiritual gifts. It doesn't need to be only if you're musical. It doesn't need to be only if you're an expressive kind of person. It, all those things are very secondary. You and I are called to be worshipers. It doesn't matter how it comes out. It doesn't matter how indignified, how tone deaf. It doesn't matter. We're all called to be worshipers. And in the same way that these shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, not because, oh, because things were right and, and the lights were dim and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't because of that. It's simply they're praising God for all they had heard and seen. They beheld a God who was in glory and a God who was showing himself in humility, and they couldn't help but glorify and praise God from that place. So if we are indeed a people who are encountering God firsthand as witnesses, and we are bearing witness of that by encouraging others through our testimony, we will leave this place as worshipers, as people. Man, even if I was like, everybody shut up, nobody sing today, there should be something in you like, no, I'm going to sing today. You know, you can't stop me. You know, it's like that kind of like, like, do you not realize who God is and what he's done in my life? Do you not realize that this is a, a God who's living and who actually hears the words that we are singing to him. 
This is not a, a force. This is not a, a, a you know, a, 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 I don't know, like a kind of thing. It's like a God who has, you know, volition, who has feelings, who has affections, who actually hears the words that you are singing, who knows your situation intricately, and who is receiving a worship that is God-glorifying unto himself. And that is the reason why we worship. And so this, this is what we learn from these humble shepherds. It doesn't matter what kind of background they have. It doesn't matter how, whether they were educated or not, what they were doing in the middle of, like they were being inconvenienced in that moment. Jesus invites them to be witnesses, to be encouragers, and to be worshipers. And we are ending, you know, the year very soon. Um, next week will be our last service in the year 2023. Isn't that crazy? Um, and my desire, you know, is... For us, you know, as a community, to make certain commitments before the Lord. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to start, you know, uh, closing with this. Uh, I'll invite up the praise team in just a second. I've been reading some articles and some statistics that I find really fascinating. And it's talking about how post-COVID, um, how church attendance has very quickly dwindled. And, and how it shouldn't, shouldn't be something, something that, that we expect as pastors anymore. Things, things like, like consistent attendance. Things, things like, oh, like, like if, if, if it's inconvenient for people, if it's kind of out of the way, if it's not at the, the optimal time, if it's not, you know, like with all the bells and whistles and, and like a good sound system and like all these different supporting things, then you shouldn't expect, you know, people to uh, continue to attend you know, to be consistent and committed as a community. You know, I've been, I've been reading that, and just something doesn't sit right with me regarding that. Because that tells me that it was never about Jesus to begin with. It tells me that it was about how comfortable our seats are, how if it's climate controlled or not in here, of like, man, it's like too late or too early, and like, uh, you know, and like, man, when the weather's terrible, like, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll, I think I'll stay home, you know, and I'll just watch, on, you know, on the stream, or like, man, if I had a really rough week, then I don't know, like, church becomes an optional thing. That just doesn't sit right with me. I don't know, like, the way that I was modeled Christianity growing up was like, Christianity and church is just not an optional thing. It's like, this is where I come to get fed. This is where I come to give God something that, it should be costly. So it should be inconvenient, actually. If it's a little too convenient, the question should be asked, like, is this worth something? Or is it just like, well, I'm showing up because it's actually very convenient. I live down the street. Or like, that's really convenient. It's like things are catered to my demographic. Those questions should be asked. My aim, you know, as a Christian is not to, keep going towards the path of least resistance, like where I need things to be more and more convenient for me to actually be more committed, I don't think that is a Christian witness throughout history, and I don't think that's what we want here as a community. What we want to see here as a community is a community that believes that Jesus Christ is worth a costly sacrifice. It's worth inconvenience. We have some people who attend our service here who take the KTX to get here on a Sunday. That blew my mind one day. Because like, I'm like, I intentionally live somewhere close because I can't commute. Like I, I need to make it as convenient as possible. When I heard that there was people who were actually taking the KTX to come here on a Sunday morning, I was like, oh, every complaint in my mouth you know, dies, <laughs> right? When, when I hear that there's people who are going through a really, really, really hard time in their lives and they're still choosing to come out here, for me, that blesses me. That tells me, wow, like for me, it's no problem to actually come out here on a Sunday morning. But if they're going through all that and it's something that's costly, man, the Lord must be just so pleased. There's people here who are going through financial difficulty. And this year, they've made it a point to give extravagantly. Whoa. Oh, the camel. Okay. They, they made it a point to give extravagantly, and not because they have loads and loads of leftovers. It's because they want to give in a costly way, and that has blessed me so much. And so this is the kind of community that I see and I'm encouraged by, where I'm like, wow, but like people actually love Jesus. Like, they're not going to just, you know, be fair weather when it comes to, like, showing up here, when it comes to committed to community, to sow into community, to sow into other people's lives. This past year, you know, I was so blessed, you know, some of our parents, they said, 
you know, we have children, but we don't want that to get in the way of us being discipled in the word. And so we want to create a house church that's for parents. And it's chaos every week. It is like a circus every week. We're trying to feed our children. Some of them are napping. Some of them are about to go nap. Some of them have missed their nap altogether. You know, and it's like every week is chaos. But man, we got through two questions today on Genesis chapter something, right? And like, man, okay, for those five minutes, we're able to worship the Lord through his word. I was so blessed to hear that. If I was a parent, I'd be like, you know what? This this is not working for me. Like, yeah, maybe I'll get back into the word once my kids hit a certain kind of age and then we don't need to. But I was just so blessed to hear our parents taking initiative this past year. Where they're like, we don't want to wait until it's convenient. We actually want to come together as parents, and as crazy as it is, as, you know, every week it's a different time and a different location and all of that, but, man, we want to commit to the Word of God, and we'll do whatever we can, and even if it's just one question, two questions that we can go through uh, on a given week, we're still wanting to commit to that. That was such a blessing for me to hear. For me, when I see that, I'm thinking, like, this is the kind of modeling of Christianity that I want our children to grow up around where they look around and they see the adults. We're the adults, by the way, now. (laughs) We are. (laughs) When they see adults around them, they're like, oh, no, I remember growing up in church, and it wasn't like only when it's convenient. It was actually like this was a regular part of their life. Like their week was incomplete if they didn't come together to, to gather and worship God. It was incomplete if they're not in the Word. That's the kind of witness that I want our, our children to grow up around. Not just that, man, when it's convenient and when we have things going for us, then, yeah, then we worship the Lord. When things are going our way, when prayers are answered, that's when we worship the Lord. Uh, When we have a lot of excess, that's when we give to the Lord. Like, I don't want that to be the kind of witness that our children grow up around. And so I've been just so blessed by this community this past year. You know, I talk about this here and there, but I feel like as a pastor, I've, I've, Man, I'm just so lucky. I'm so lucky that I get to worship with a community that, for me, has modeled and encouraged me to, man, I want to give even more to the Lord. I want to love the Lord more. I want to know the Word more. I want to pray more this upcoming year where, where there's an encouragement and an iron, sharp, sharpening iron. And, man, there's moments where, man, when, when I'm kind of like waning and when I'm feeling discouraged, I look around and there's people who are willing to pray for me and fight for me and are reminding me that this is worth it. Uh, this is the kind of community that I'm just so grateful for this past year.